You are listening to the After the Timeout podcast, hosted by Todd Zazadil and John Palicki, two high school head coaches looking to help others spread their passion for the game of basketball. Tune in for episodes about anything basketball related, on the court, off the court, and anything in between. We at the After the Timeout podcast would like to take a full timeout to talk about V Reps basketball. Coaches, do you get frustrated by how some players just cannot seem to learn your offensive system? Are you spending countless hours teaching your offensive system to your team just for them to forget by the next practice? You should check out V Reps. V Reps was founded by basketball players and coaches to create tools that make learning plays easily a reality. V-Reps allows coaches to turn their 2D playbook into a 3D interactive video game that players can watch on any mobile device on their own time. Don't just have players watch film, have them live it and control the players so that they have a better, more efficient learning experience. It's free to try. Go to vreps.us to sign up today. All right, on today's episode, we are joined by Kramer Soderberg, head coach of Milliken University's men bas- men's basketball program. Coach, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us. Hey, how's it going, guys? Appreciate you having me on. Looking forward to this. Thank you. So we always like to start with a segment we call the opening tip. It's just a, an opportunity for our guests to, to kind of get loose, be themselves. So we wanted to start with you. Um, you know, you're an author yourself. So, but we want to know from you, what's one of your favorite books that you've read on coaching or leadership yeah. uh, that you've used and helping you in your journey? Sure. Yo, that's, that's a tough question. I'm, I'm a big reader, love to read. Um, I'd say probably the biggest one from a coaching perspective uh, that I've really latched onto um, was Chop Wood, Carry Water um, by Joshua Medcap. That one, um, that one was really, really important for me. Um, at the time that I was reading it, um, because I read it, uh, probably I was probably into my fourth or my fifth year as an assistant coach, my second year, um, at Milliken and just that, that reminder to, yeah, it's going to be a grind, you know, things are going to be a grind as an assistant coach. And, um, you know, you just keep, keep every day, chop wood, carry water every day, do the things the right way, the way you're supposed to be done at a high level to the best of your ability. And, and once you do those things on a consistent basis, it'll pay off in the end. Um, and for me, it was um, just a great reminder, something that I needed kind of during those stretch of years that I read it. So I guess we want to also start off with giving you a chance since, since you're an Illinois guy, Illinois guy like us to kind of, to kind of plug your program, um, you know, tell us about what you guys got going on um, and also uh, kind of talk about the CCIW in general and, and, and what makes it such, such a great conference. Uh, Cause you know, I know people from the Midwest know, Right. Uh, but maybe people from from outside, you know, of our you know Midwest area wouldn't know that the CCIW sure. is, is one of the best conferences. Oh, yeah. In the nation. Well, frankly, I, I didn't know about it until I came, you know, like I it was I, I lived in the Midwest my whole life. And, and I had no idea how good the league was until I got here six years ago. Um, first and foremost, yeah, Millican University is in Decatur, Illinois, basically right in between Champaign and Springfield. Uh, beautiful university, beautiful campus, um, high academic school. It's, you know, small college, uh, like most of Division three schools. We got about 2,200 kids fluctuates each year. But, uh, you know, beautiful campus. And then as far as my basketball program goes, yeah, I just got hired about uh, four months ago, um, late April and taking over a program that's that's kind of been down and out for a little while and uh, looking to, to build something special here. And um, I'm excited about the, the adventure and the challenge that that's ahead of me. Uh, Milliken is, a, in my opinion, is, is a gem. We got a lot to offer. The campus is beautiful. Our facilities are getting better and better as the years go on. Um, I think academically, you know, we're really really good. And, and then I, as a, as a basketball coach, I think I offer a 
lot of things uh, to kids um, from a lot of different vantage points. Um, and we're, we're going to approach every day uh, the same way, chopping wood, carrying water, really consistency with our effort and our intensity and our focus and all that. And we're going to try to climb the, climb the mountain that is that CCIW league, which is a tremendous league. Um, and going into a little bit of that, when I first came into the league, I wasn't quite sure it was kind of being my first stint at division three level. I'd played at the division one level, been around it my whole life with my dad, um, played at the division two level, NAI level, um, but never had seen division three basketball. And man, when I, when I first got into the league, I was just blown away by how good the players were, how good the coaches were. And, and I tell people this often, if you take the top three teams in our league and put them in any division two league in the country, they're going to be just fine. They're going to be just fine. So in the CCIW, if you don't have division two level talent, you're not winning basketball games. Um, and, and that's what I got to get get done here at Milliken. And it's a high execution league, high skill league, great IQs, great coaches. I just can't talk enough about the league. And um, I'm excited for the challenge and excited to be thrown in the fire as a young head coach and, and see what I can do. Yeah, we but with Todd and I obviously from this area, you know, competed uh, uh, in coaching at the college level. We're very well aware of the CCIW. We wanted to hit on with you, maybe just a more of a fun topic for you specifically and, and your dad. You had mentioned your dad, obviously. Uh, for the listeners that don't know your dad, your dad's kind of coached all around the country uh, at the D1 level, the D3 level, the D2 yeah. level. Um you know, so we, we wanted to just talk about the influence of your dad. You know, first of all, what was it like to play for him? What were some of the lessons you learned from him as a coach? And what are some of the things that you've done differently than maybe he did? Yeah, no, this is this is a great topic. Yeah, like you said, my, my dad's been a longtime college basketball coach, uh, coached at Loris College, South Dakota State, assistant in, uh, assistant at Wisconsin, uh, head coach at St. Louis and Lindenwood, and now he's at Virginia. So he's been all over the place, all different levels. Um, he is a great coach, and anybody in the business who's been in there a long time knows how good a coach he is. He is, he is phenomenal. The things I've learned from him are – Gosh, I could spend hours upon hours talking about all the things I've learned from him. Um, you know, a few things, you know, that stand out right away is, is one, doing it the right way, you know. Um, and my dad, you know, in a business that is, um, to say it lightly, made up of a lot of people who don't do it the right way. Uh, a lot of people who bend the rules and go around, you know, sneak around corners and whatever they got to do. My dad has done it the right way at high level college basketball his whole career. And I was thrilled when he got rewarded for that and winning a title with Virginia. Um, so that that was number one is is building building the program the right way and doing it the right way and not being influenced by the pressure of you have to win. And if you don't win, this is what happens. No, build your program the right way with good people and and good things will come from that. Um, so I would say that's kind of first and foremost, doing it the right way is what I learned from him. From a basketball side of things, um, I think one of my dad's greatest strengths as a basketball coach is his, his ability as a game planner. Um, he was a phenomenal game planner, especially a defensive game planner um, and his preparation for games and his ability to find out what his opponent's strengths were and then creating a plan to stop those strengths. Um, he was just really, really good at that. And I remember as a young kid, you know, just sitting on the floor, watching him watch tape, watching him prep game plans. Um, and those are things that I've taken away um, as a basketball coach from an X and O standpoint that I think are going to be very useful. Um, and then <laughs> things that I maybe won't take from him. And he's always, you know, of course he's given me advice and he has plenty of things to say, don't do it this way. Um, but he was, he's a fiery guy, a passionate guy and always has been, and I'm the same way. Um, but he, he is always harping on me to, um, hone in that passion and not lose it lose control of it um, like he would sometimes with the officials and with his players. And he often says, oh, I, you know, I, I regret saying that to that kid or, you know, acting that way in front of the game. So he always he always encourages me to, yes, of course, be passionate, be fiery about the game, but learn to control those passions so that your kids always see you under control. Your kids always see you confident. And um, that that'll be something that um, will be a challenge. I think it's a challenge for every coach, obviously, but um, 
Um, I definitely got a little of my dad in me, so I'm going to have to be able to hone in that fire a little bit. Little as, as most dads do, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. So, so you said, you know, you obviously mentioned you're, you got hired in April. Um, you're, you're kind of coming in there first season, taking over a program. Sure. Um, you know, what are the things that you want to establish with your program uh, and, and your culture? And what are you, things that you believe are important? And then the second step is how do you go about doing that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, any, any good program, you know, has a great culture. So that's, that is first and foremost, when you're taking over a program, especially a program that's been down and out for a little while is you have to, you have to establish a culture of winning, um, right away. And I actually had, a. a I felt like a, you know, a different advantage that most people didn't get at least at division three level in that this past, this past spring, because of the COVID rules and we weren't following the 19 weeks anymore. And we had a certain number of days we could use uh, after the season was over. I still had like 20 usable days that we were able to use in the spring. Um, so for me, that was, that was pretty nice after I got hired that, um, normally I wouldn't be able to get in the gym with our guys and start establishing that culture until the fall. But I was able to do that with all of our guys who are returning. And I think that was a, a major benefit, um, a major benefit for me in the program in that I was able to establish with those guys, this is how we are going to practice. Th these are, you know, the established cultural rules. This is how we're going to act. This is how we're going to perform. This is how we're going to, you know, be teammates and the level of competition, all that stuff that you don't usually get to establish until the fall. I got to establish in the spring so that my returners can help me establish that with my young guys who come in now. And that was really beneficial for me. And um, yeah, like you said, if, if you don't establish a culture uh, of winning right away, when you take over a program, uh, nothing else that you do matters. X's and O's don't matter. The, you know, the type of talent you don't, doesn't matter. You have to have a great solid foundation and then everything else will come along with it. So uh, that's the goal and we're, we're heading in the right direction. That's for sure. So let's, let's kind of take that a step further and, and now kind of, you know, that the process of the system is all when you take over the program, the process of evaluating players, scouting opponents, how do you kind of start to go about, you know, a Todd Knight, you know, I've been head coaches and, and kind of have our own ways, but for you, how do you go about the process of that install evaluation scouting all those extra things yeah no it's i mean preparing yourself to be a head coach isn't isn't something that happens once you get hired you know it's something that you're establishing over the years you know so you know ever since i've become you know become an assistant and gotten into college coaching i've always known that i've wanted to be a head coach so i would say probably you know probably 6 years ago i started you know writing in a notebook and the title of the notebook was when i become a head coach and I just started writing in all those things that um, I wanted to do. What did I want my culture to be like? What did what type of kids do I want to recruit? You know, how is my depth chart going to look? What offense and defense and different things like that? And I just started writing those notes down. And um, I suggest any coach who wants to be a head coach one day to start doing that. I think it's a, it's a great thing. And I've worked under some you know great head coaches, uh, men who I still stay in contact, who I respect a whole lot. Lot. And I've, I've taken things from them that I liked and I wrote those down. Yeah, this is something I definitely want to do. And I've also on the, on the flip side of it, taken things that I didn't, I didn't think worked or things that I, maybe we shouldn't do it that way. Or I thought, ah, that was a little iffy. And I would write those things down. And then you compile this whole kind of program blueprint in your head and on paper so that when you do get the job, when I did get offered the job at Milliken, I was prepared and ready to go. And, and that's when I dove into things. And, and luckily, like, I said, I had that spring to kind of start establishing things. Um, and then once you get your staff hired, we worked through the summer to kind of go through kind of that checklist of things. Okay. How do we want to manage practice plans? How do we want to do scouting? How do we want to do uh, recruiting and so on and so forth. And you just go down that whole list and you just get a, a preparatory plan for when those, those kids get back on campus and, and you're ready to roll. So I felt well prepared when I got hired because I kind of had almost imagined my program in my head for so many years. And that allowed things to, to flow pretty easily. I felt. 
So you just mentioned recruiting and I think we all know that recruiting's kind of taken a different look after COVID, <laughs> yeah. right? It changed quite a bit. Um, but, but just in general, uh, you know, what are you looking for in a recruit? Um, you know, it could be system, it could be characteristics, um, you know, and then we, we, we talked about the advantage of CCIW. So that's one of the advantages, but some of the advantages and disadvantages to recruiting in division three. Sure. Yeah. Well, for me, first and foremost, I always say there's there's four things I look for in a player. Um, and the first one, actually, the first three are not good player. The first th first is good person. Right. I want I want good people in my program. I want high character young men. Second is hard workers. Right. I want I want kids who are invested in becoming the best players they can be there. There's a lot of guys out there who say they want to be good players, but they really don't want to be good players. You know, they say they love the game of basketball, but they really don't love the game of basketball. They're lukewarm about it. I want guys who are hard workers, guys who are going to be in the gym. And that is so I mean, it's in so important at any level. But, man, it is vitally important at the Division three level, because once the offseason hits, we we can condition these guys and, and we can, you know, get in the weight room with them, but we can't do individual workouts like division one and division two can, you know, like they, those guys can pull those guys in the gym and force them to do something. I got to find kids who like desire to do that, who are going to do it no matter if I tell them to do it or not. And then at the same time, division three guys, if you don't love the game, you, you are not going to last because frankly, you have no incentive to be there, no financial incentive, at least, you know, division two and division one guys, they have, they have a paycheck. Basically they got their school paid for. And if they decide to stop playing, then that money goes away. So I got to find guys who are just hardworking kids who love the game, who are invested in, in becoming the best they can be. Secondly, I want invested students, right? I want kids. I don't need geniuses. I don't need guys who are, uh, you know, 32 ACTs. I'm, that's great. Um, but I don't have to have them. You know, I want, I want kids who just care about getting a degree. You know, they don't have to be brainiacs, but they do have to care about getting their degree. And then finally, fourthly, I need, I need great talent. Um, so those are kind of the four characteristics of, of guys that I look for. And, you know, talent is so important, especially in the CCIW, of course. But I think if you neglect those first three and only focus on the talent, you're going to end up you're going to end up eating it anyways all right so my second kind of part of that question is um and again this is very CCIW ish too and it's a lot of conferences as well but um what do you think recruits don't expect coming into playing college basketball what are some of the things that they're they're surprised by I mean you mentioned some of them a little bit in your answer but sure. you know what are some of those other things yeah. Okay. So I, I tell almost all of our recruits and I get a lot of questions from parents and, you know, kids, okay, you know, what, what's the biggest challenge that I'm going to have to face going from high school to college. I always say that I think there's two major challenges. Um, one of which is the physicality, speed and athleticism in the game. I, I think that is, that is such a big jump from high school to college, no matter what level you, you go to. And especially if you've watched a CCIW, <laughs> CCIW game, it's a man's game, boy. I mean, it's, it's physical oh, yeah, no basketball. I mean, no there, there There's are some dudes. There's some dudes, I mean, big guys, the juniors and seniors play. And if you aren't a man in the weight room, you are not, you are not going to be able to handle yourself on the court in the CCIW. And it's just a physical league. And um, I love it. it. It's got a big 10 feel to it, in my opinion. You know, I think the CCIW is, is the big 10 of division three basketball. Um, so I, I think that's kind of the, the big thing is, um, is strength, athleticism, quickness, speed of the game, all that stuff usually takes kids a little bit of time to get used to. And then secondly, I think at the college level, I think most high school kids don't realize how focused and intense they have to be all the time. You know, I think a lot of high school kids, especially the, the good players, they can get by with being locked in for like spurts you know, being locked in for a two minute stretch and then kind of taking a break and then another two minute stretch. But at the college level, if you take a break, if you take a breath, if you lose focus for 30 seconds, you're going to get hurt. You know, you're going to, you're going to 
get back door cut. You're going to get beat off the bounce. You're going to whatever. You're going to make a mistake. So I think a lot of our young kids and they, they see it right away in practice is the pace of practice and the level of intensity all the way through from start to finish. And those are the two major things that I've seen most high school kids struggle with is strength and athleticism, speed of the game, and then that ability to stay locked in, focused and intense for the duration of a practice, a game, a film study, whatever it may be. Yeah, no, no doubt. So I wanted to talk to you about your transition assistant coach to head coach. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, you, you, you wrote down in your journal and you, you prepared, but you know, writing it down and visualizing is different than oh, yeah. getting in the actual yes, head, this is head coach's chair. Um, so, you know, as you're transitioning here and, and you're, you're learning and, and you're building your program, what are some of the differences you've learned between moving from that assistant coach chair to the head coach chair? Yeah, great question. I, and, and I'm actually, I'm in a pretty unique situation that you don't necessarily see very often in that normally when a, an assistant coach takes over for the head coach at the place he's been, right. the program had been very successful beforehand, you know, so I, I'm in a little bit different situation. So it's kind of unique in that, you know, I was the assistant coach under the past two head coaches here. Um, and again, both great men, good coaches, and um, just it didn't work out the way we had hoped. And, and now I have an opportunity to, to kind of shift things and change things a little bit. So there is a, a level of challenge that comes with that, um, that, that idea that, okay, we hadn't been very good and you were in that program. So what's going to be different, you know, and that was something that the question that I had to keep answering, you know, through the interview process is what's going to be different. And I really wanted to establish a, a big change. Not that everything we did in the past was bad, but, but I did want to establish a change. Like this is a shift. This is, this is going to be different. Our culture is different. The things we do different, even if it's small little things, you know, the way we stretch or the way we warm up, I want everything to be different and changed. Um, and I thought that was kind of, uh, you know, a, a good way of kind of just shifting things quickly. And then you asked another question. I, I forgot what it was. Uh, no, just, just, you know, even, even more the differences, like, okay, what are you realizing now that oh, yeah, yeah, you were yeah. an assistant, but now you're a head coach and you're like, you, yeah, you know it, but you don't realize it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've I, growing up as, you know, the son of a head coach, you know, my dad was a head coach most of my life. I, I know what head coaches go through, um, but I had never experienced it personally. And instantly, once I became a head coach, I, I knew I knew the major difference right away. And I've, I've told many people this is as an assistant coach, when you're in the office or at the gym, you're the assistant coach. But when you go home, that light switch turns off and you know, now you're a husband, father, and you're, you're just kind of doing your own thing. You can kind of forget about the program um, for those few hours, but as a head coach, very different. And I, and I felt that immediately is that, yeah, when I was in the office, I'm doing everything, you know, I was the head coach, but then when I came home, I was still the head, you know, like it was like, I was constantly thinking, okay, what's the next thing I have to do? What, how can I, you know, how do I change this? What, you know, what phone calls do I have to make tomorrow? And it was like, I couldn't turn off being the head coach, like I could the assistant. And that is what I found to be one of the biggest differences for me and biggest challenges for me, just because the competitor I am, you know, the, the guy who's, you know, trying to attain perfection and chase that down. I'm, I'm, my wheels are constantly constantly turning of what do I need to do next? How is our offense going to be dead? Or what can I do defensively? Uh, pre, you know, just everything going through my mind never turned off. And it's funny too, probably in my first week and a half, um, that I was named the head coach, my parents came to visit me in Decatur, me and my family. And, um, they stayed for the weekend. And after my mom and dad left, my dad called me like a day later and he said, Hey, you know, is, is everything okay? And I said, I said, yeah, it's fine. Why do you ask that? And he said, he said this weekend, he said, you, you were with us, but you weren't with us. You know, he said, you, you were in the building, you were at you know, you were sitting at the dinner table with us, you were in the house, but you weren't there, you weren't there. And that was something that really hit me early on. I was like, I don't want to be that way. You know, I, I don't want it to be that way. Um, I want to be a all in coach. But when I get home, 
I want to be a husband and a father too, you know, and I, and I want to learn how to, to turn that light switch off for those, t- those hours that I'm with my family and then be able to switch it right back on when I'm ready to get to work. So I thought that for me was the biggest thing that stood out from changing from an assistant coach to a head coach. And again, my dad made it very apparent to me that, that I needed to, to work on some things right away. Well, I think a lot of times when people take over as a head coach, you know, at least I was, you know, when I first started to take over my high school program is, is that idea of delegation. Like it, it's okay to say to your assistants, like, I can't do these three things. I really need you to take care of them. And then yeah. be okay with them taking care of them yeah. Whether it's to your standard or not, just mm-hmm. be okay with that. So you, you led me perfectly into the, the next thing we wanted to talk to you about, which was work life balance. And you know, you're, you're married, you have, I believe, three kids, coach? Yeah, three kids. Yep. Three under seven. So I'm in the middle of madness, baby. Woo. So, <laughs> you know, along with that, you know, what would you say to our listeners? And you just kind of hit on it, but I wanted to go a little bit deeper. You know, Todd and I have both been head coaches ourselves, both trying to do the same thing. You know, what are your personal keys or what are the things for you that are going to ensure your work life balance that you think maybe another coach that's listening to us and our listener could benefit from? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, I, being around the game for so long and and seeing seeing what my dad went through as a head coach, I think right away it's it's learning to understand that, yes, winning is important, but I'm going to be okay if I don't win, you know, I I think that that is such an important aspect that I, I learned from my dad watching my dad is again, so competitive, so passionate, desired so badly to win. And I think he allowed the, the winning and losing to really affect him sometimes at home. And now later on his, in his career, as he reflects on it and his talks to me about it, I think he can say, all that, all that matters is that I put everything I have into winning the game. And then at the end of the day, it's okay if it, if it doesn't happen, you know, as long as my preparation, as long as my practice planning is my game planning, if all that says success is all, if all that says you did everything you can do to be great, then the, the result isn't as important. And I, th- I think when I approach this job, I, I, I said the same thing that at, at the end of my tenure as, as a head coach or at Millican or whatever it may be, I, I might be the head coach at Millican for the next 35 years and end my career here, or I might get fired in five years. But either way, if I can say at the end of that tenure, man, I laid it on the line. You know, I put everything I had into the program. Every time I was in the office, I, I was doing everything I could to help my team win. I prepared everything I could do, I did. Um, I can say I'm a success. And if I look at it that way, I can, I can be okay with whatever happens. And I think whenever you, when you get to a point like that, that doesn't mean you don't want to win. That doesn't mean you don't care about winning. That doesn't mean you're not competitive or you're not passionate or you're not giving it your all. It just means that I know whether I win or lose, whether I'm a success in people's eyes or a failure in people's eyes, I'm going to be okay. You know, like I don't define myself by that. And I think once I once you're able to do that and say that, um, then everything else in your life, it's easier to balance. Um, you, you have a little bit more freedom to say, yeah, I did my work today. I can come home and relax. I can take time to be with my family and not think about that and not spend, you know, uh, 18 hours in the office and just spend 10 hours in the office or whatever it is. And um, I. I hope and I pray and I work at that to, to constantly remind myself that that's all that matters. And we'll see once the winning and losing starts happening, how good I am at that. But um, I'm hoping I can, I can do a good job at that and and always remember that just, just fill it all the way to the top, be the best you can be. And at the end of the day, that that's sufficient. Well, something else that we, you know, we found interesting and you kind of mentioned in, in the beginning about your own experience you know, you, you kind of played on the division one, division two levels, coached in division two and, and, and obviously now division three. And, and you kind of hit out in the beginning. But, you know, if you had to say to our for our listeners, what's one big similarity that all the levels have no matter what? And maybe what's big one big difference between the levels? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, similarity is you're competing at whatever level you're at. You know, there's there's no difference in the level of, you know, desire and passion and competitiveness. There is no different. I, I don't care if you're playing. You know, I, I played my sophomore year. I played at Kentucky in Rupp Arena and, you know, went against John Wall and all those guys that that competitive, that desire to win was the same that I had when I played at Wesleyan as an assistant coach that that's not different. You know, it doesn't matter how many people are in the crowd or how big the lights are or, or whatever that desire to win is the same. And that competitiveness is the same. And um, I think that's a, a big misconception of like, you know, they play harder or they're more competitive or it's more passionate at that. No, it's not at all. Um, and then I would say the biggest difference for me, at least, you know, coaching at this level and then playing at, you know, a division one level is I feel like the balance at, that our players get and that I get as a coach is far different um, at the division three level than it is at the division one level. I think our players have quite a bit better opportunity to be a great student, have a social life and be a basketball player than the kids at the division one level do to do all three. You know, for me playing at the division one level at Miami of Ohio, I felt like a lot of times I was 90% basketball, 10% academics and not much social life, you know? So I think that for me is just thinking back and then watching my players. I think that is one of the biggest differences between maybe that highest level and, and the division three level. All right. So I want to go back and kind of reflect over the last year and a half. That's been different than any other year. Yeah. I've been kind of thinking this late, lately, making, making coaching more efficient, right? During the last year and a half, you kind of had a, okay, what's important, right? You, then you take some, pull some things out. Um, so you know, I want to talk to you about what have we learned over the last year? And is there, is there some things that coaches can eliminate, right? Uh, you know, based on looking at, okay, we only had this limited amount of time over the last year and a half. What, what can we eliminate? What's not as important as it maybe used to be? Man. Yeah. Good question. Um, I would say, you know, I would say from a basketball standpoint, when we were going through the season, you know, you, you get, you get those, we were playing basically um, two games like back to back, you know, so like we were playing like Thursday, Saturday games, basically the whole year. Um, and when, when you start to kind of compound your practices and, and have to shorten them up, then you begin to realize, okay, like what, what do we have to get in, into practice? What, what is most important to get done here? And that's when you start to kind of minimize those maybe less baseline out of bounds and less uh, special scenarios and stuff like that. But we really, last year, we really tried to not get lost in losing the fundamental side of the game. And I think that's what a lot of coaches can get um, just, distracted by is, oh, I have less time now, or the, as the season goes on, you forget about those, those basic fundamentals of your program. Um, and I think if you get lost in that, um, no matter what you're doing with your offense or defense, if you get lost away from your fundamentals that you started with, I think it can hinder you a little bit. So for me, as, as a practice planner, I always try to implement the basic fundamentals of what we want to do, whether it's closeouts or passing and catching ball handling. Um, I try to implement implement those, especially later in the year, as much into the warm up as I can, you know, because everybody's going to warm up, all coaches are going to warm up. And a lot of coaches will do the, you know, okay, let's do the three man weave, let's do the layup lines. And those are all fine. But I think there's ways to implement, you, you know, fundamental drills that everybody's doing at the beginning of the season and implementing those into your warm ups so that you're almost killing two birds with one stone there. Um, and then man, from from a logistical standpoint, um, I, I, man, I don't know. It's, it's hard to kind of manage that for us. It was the recruiting was very difficult, not, not being able to see kids in person like that. That was, that was a challenge for sure. Um, but I think at least, and maybe I'll jump to a recruiting standpoint um, because we had less time and there were less games and less players to see. I think at least last year for me, 
I really honed in my recruiting to a, a smaller pool almost, you know, normally we are attacking maybe a bigger number of kids, but last year I felt like I, I really attacked a smaller number, but paid more attention to them and focused more on them and went and saw them personally more often than I did in previous years. And um, I brought in a really good recruiting class. I, I feel really happy about my freshman class coming in and they were kind of, you know, first recruited, I recruited them as an assistant and then they all committed or most of them committed. And then the coaching thing went into limbo. And then when I got hired, I kind of re-recruited them and brought them back in. But I think that, um, that idea of fishing with a hook and not with a net, um, at least from a college perspective is a good way to approach it. At least I think it's the best way to. So we like to finish with two segments. The first one we call 30 second timeout. Uh, as we joke with coaches all the time, there's no official in your timeout telling you your 30 <laughs> second timeout's over. So it's a rough 30, uh, but it's your platform to talk about anything that you want to talk to our listeners about your program or uh, for you, your books or something you're passionate about outside of basketball or another organization or charity or a story you want to share or a unique topic. But the floor is yours, 30 seconds, anything you want to share. Great. Uh, yeah, for me, I mean, right off the bat, thinking about, you know, something that I'm, um, that's important to me or that's, you know, I'm very interested in um, my faith as a, as a Christian. Um, I, I'm a cradle Catholic kid and um, that i kind of have my own little ministry that, that I got going on as a, as a Christian speaker, as a Catholic speaker. And um, I wrote a book, as you mentioned, called fill your cup for Christ, a spiritual journey sown and grown through sports. Um, so that's kind of something that um, I've invested time in and it's, it's reaped a lot of fruit for me and uh, something that I care, care a great deal about. And, and um, never thought I would become an author because I'm not a very good writer, but uh, I attacked it anyways. And uh, it's it's turned out to be great. And I've had so many positive responses on that. So anybody who is interested in, in you know, the, the Christian Catholic faith and, um, you know, wants to learn a little bit more about that with, a, you know, with a sports theme to it and an easy read, uh, you can find that book on Amazon. Um, so that that is that's something that I'd love to mention. I appreciate you allowing me to do it. All right, last segments, quick hitters, just rapid fire questions. Okay, could be could be basketball related, could be super super random. All right, right. so uh, and I I can't I can't say this uh, pleasantly because I'm a Cubs fan, but your favorite St. Louis Cardinals memory because you're a St. Louis you're, you're St. Louis guy. Okay, okay, okay. First and foremost, I I wouldn't claim to be a huge St. Louis Cardinals. Okay, fan. okay. Um, I, you know, my younger years, I grew up in Wisconsin. I, okay. I've never been a big baseball fan. My kids are largely getting into the Cardinals, so I'm kind of following them. My wife's from <laughs> St. Louis, but I'll flip the question. My favorite Packer memory, because I am oh, a that's I'm even a worse Uber that's Packer worse. fan. Oh but, man, um, yeah, we will yeah. hold it against them. Yeah, yeah exactly. Hold me against it. That's fine. Uh, favorite Packer memory, um, probably 2005. No, 2008. Packers, Seahawks, Brett Favre in the snow. That game just sticks out to me for whatever reason. Uh, I think he tackled Donald Driver in the end zone and threw a snowball at a coach or something. It was it was awesome. So that that's favorite Packer memory. All right. So I I'm gonna I'm gonna hit it. We weren't gonna hit it, but I'm gonna hit it anyway. And you can choose. I'll let you choose either Wisconsin or Missouri. I'll let I'll let you choose your favorite landmark in either one of those places oh my um well favorite landmark is lambeau field probably in the country um it's phenomenal i'm sorry bears fans but it's phenomenal um but in missouri main street downtown main street in st charles missouri awesome place if you've never been there st charles my hometown st charles missouri main street's a, a great little place all right we'll we'll get back to basketball here pressure man or pack line well Pack line, um, but pack line isn't soft. Pack line is pressure. Right. So pressure pack well, line. There you go. There you go. Well, I know there's a very divide there, though. You know, you know how it is. Yeah, I know. There's, we're, there's a, well, I we're in the gaps. We're in the gaps. All I right. Think there his dad go. played for Dick Bennett, so that I was. Well, I know, to... I know, but you yeah. never know. Yeah, you invented never both know. of them. Sure. You never know. All right, so this is a great one, and I'll give credit to Todd for this one. Give us one of your stories, a youth a youth sports story for you, your claim to fame as a youth athlete. Youth athlete. Oh my goodness. Um, like, did you win a spelling bee or something? You know, <laughs> something like that. 
Uh, okay, if we're talking grade school, youth athlete, my claim to fame story that I always tell, um, probably sixth grade basketball, St. Cletus grade school, playing Bar Mayo grade school. Um, they throw a triangle and two at us, but they put the two guys on me. <laughs> oh, oh so they, awesome. didn't, they didn't have two guys on two separate guys. They put two guys on me and they put a, everybody else in the triangle. So that's my claim to fame. Grade that's school. That, that's pretty cool. Uh, all right. So if you had to pick a retro Jersey, any sport. Ooh, man. I don't, uh, yeah, I think it's considered retro retro. I'd go um, MJ black pinstripe. Yes. Ooh, see now you redeemed yourself a little yes. bit. Yeah. I mean, you that's big. Your, that's yeah. big. There we go. All right. So we, I'm going to, I'm going to tweak this because I know what your answer is going to be, but I'm going to tweak it. If you could coach another sport besides basketball, what sport would you coach? Ooh. Um, I would, I would probably say football. Uh, really love football. My biggest regret in life is not playing high school football. That is my biggest regret in life. I, I love the game and I, I had kind of a run into people mentality as a basketball player. I would have liked it. Um, so I think football, I do love playing golf though. If, if, if I would pick something to play, it would be golf, but coach probably football. All right. Uh, favorite quote or saying, Ooh, favorite quote or saying, um, well, I love the, the Mike Tyson quote, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. That's one of my favorites. Uh, a Padre Pio quote, pray, hope, and don't worry. Uh, I like that one a lot. Um, so I, I'd say those two, one sport, one, uh, one more religious. And then I just thought of another one. Uh, is there anything that you say that you, your dad might use to say that you thought you weren't going to say? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, yeah, I always, I always say, um, my dad would always say, um, do, do what I mean, not what I say. <laughs> he would always say that. So I've, I've caught myself saying that a number of times. Um, do, do what I mean, not what I say. So that, that's one for sure. That's all right. My, my father always says the phrase, just have fun with it. I don't know what that always means, but just have fun with it. Hey, I love right. it. So we got the last one. It's a flat practice or it's a flat time in practice. Ooh. The guys aren't responding. A drill in practice that you know is going to amp up the practice. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, we at, When we were at Lindenwood, uh, when my dad ran it at Lindenwood, and he ran it at SLU too, he called it Nick's rebounding. Nick's rebounding and how for, for coaches listening, how you do it is you, you break up into two teams and then you have guys basically lined up at the elbows and lined up at the block and um, coach at the free throw line. He shoots it. And those two guys are basically playing two on two. They smash into each other and whoever scores gets a point. You throw it back to the coach and go back to the end of the line and you shoot it again. And it just keeps going and keeps going. And man, I, I tackled a lot of people in that drill as a player. And, uh, uh, my players like it though. It, it gets them going and it, it's fun. And you, you get to get that football mentality a little bit. So yeah, Nick's rebounding. That's, that's the go-to right there for the, the hype up drill. Well, Coach, we, we really enjoyed this episode. We were very excited to have you on. Obviously, as Illinois guys, local guys, we'd love to have the local people on. Um, so we, we thank you for joining us today and spending some time talking basketball. Oh, it's my pleasure. Appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, uh, hopefully the, the Millican basketball name can grow and grow and grow. And we'll, uh, we'll get more folks in the gym and start winning ball games and winning championships. Thank you for listening to another episode of the After the Timeout podcast, hosted by Todd Zazadil and John Palicki. For more show content and upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at After the Timeout, or subscribe to our podcast for upcoming episodes. For show inquiries, you can email us at afterthetimeout at gmail.com. You can find all of our previous episodes on Anchor, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, Pocket Cast, Google Podcast, and Apple Podcast by searching after the timeout. We appreciate you listening. Tune in next time for more basketball content on the court, off the court, and anything in between.